Hey there YouTube, what is up? Welcome back to my channel, it is I, Nadia the Nerdy, and today we are getting into one of my all-time favorite topics to talk about, and that is A Song of Ice and Fire, aka the source material for the Game of Thrones show. That I kind of have blocked out at this point. But more specifically, we're gonna be gearing up for season two of House of the Dragon by taking a look at what makes Fire and Blood, the source material for the show, the best type of work to adapt into a series. One of the best parts of George R. R. Martin's work is how he's able to create such intricate and incredible lore throughout all of his books, not just the core Song of Ice and Fire series, but also also, his other books like The Tale of Duncan Egg, The World of Ice and Fire, and Fire and Blood. Through all of this, he was able to create one of the most expansive universes for his work, following in the footsteps of the grandfather of modern fantasy, Tolkien himself, standing on the shoulders of legends over here, by writing literal history books. I mean, that's how you do lore right there. Yeah, just right? an entire history for your world. Why not? <laughs> And I know to an average fan that might sound really tedious and hella boring to read. Like, what? Why would I read a history book for a world that doesn't even exist? Like, I don't even want to read our own world's history book. I'm speaking hypothetically here, obviously. I read that book. <laughs> wow. But let me tell you, Fire and Blood specifically is so genius and a very entertaining read and I would highly recommend. I've been thinking a lot about adaptations recently. If you follow my channel, you know I've followed certain other <laughs> adaptations out there and it got me thinking how do you adapt work in a good way and what makes some source material better than other source material fire and blood to me is the perfect type of book to adapt and we're gonna get into why in this video now, adapting George's dense and sprawling history of the Targaryen dynasty could be a daunting task for sure for any production team. But as I said before, Fire and Blood is such a brilliant choice, in my opinion, because this book isn't just a dry historical account. It's really a tapestry of myths, legends, and whispered secrets passed down through the ages and through secret tunnels. Of course, you can't forget the secret tunnels. Secret, 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 secret tunnel, yeah. But really what makes this book so great for adapting is it's told solely through unreliable narrators and is built basically through hearsay, which not only leaves room for, but also invites speculation from the audience, either in viewing or in reading. It kind of allows you to come to your own conclusions on what really occurred because there is no one universal truth to the story. There's events that happened, but the specifics of the events are shrouded in mystery. And this is exactly what makes it such a great framework. Think about it. One of the biggest complaints that fans have when their favorite work gets adopted is how much was changed from the source material. And this makes sense for certain styles of writing because they're more definitive. I mean, it's basically like this is the story because that's what was written. Meanwhile, Fire and Blood is written as if a maester is writing an account of history that was gathered from many varying stories sources, thus leaving the truth up in the air. And it's basically like a history book for not only our world as readers of the Westerosi history, but also for its own world as well, which like, well, it's kind of mind blowing if you really think about it too hard. <laughs> oh, but anyway, the book is filled with conflicting accounts and hidden agendas, not only by the people who are giving the information of the events to the maesters, but also the maesters themselves having hidden agendas and how they want the history of the realm to be presented for whatever hidden agendas they have going on in the current story of A Song of Ice and Fire. So there's layers to this here. <laughs> but this allows for endless interpretation 
interpretation and theorizing. And you know how we love to theorize. We are all about the theorizing over here. So when adapted, viewers naturally want to try to piece together this story and figure out the truth from this tapestry of lies and semi-truths. Not only that, but it also gives the showrunners more liberties with the storytelling and with the fandom as well. Since, again, there isn't one universal true story. It's written very like, well, one person says this and another person says this. I guess we'll never know type of vibe. But there's one less that the fans can get mad about. And two, fans are thus more interested in the liberties taken on a writing level since they're already trying to speculate and piece together the true story and then also wondering if what is told on screen is maybe closer to the true story. It's at least a version of the story. So it just allows a lot more leeway with the fans and I think that sets it up for more success because the more definitive a story is, I think the less fans are willing to allow for changes. Again, if you watch my videos, I know this is super off topic, but the Avatar, The Last Airbender adaptation from Netflix is a good example of how fans can become very divided. And even the Game of Thrones ending is another perfect example. We don't actually have the ending of that book series yet, but the story started changing at a certain point so dramatically from the source material that by the end of the story, it felt like a completely different story than the books. And that's when fans begin to have issues. Whereas this allows the showrunners to have more liberties, like I said. And I would say that so far, House of the Dragon has been doing a phenomenal job at capturing the essence of fire and blood. Obviously, we've only seen the very beginning of the Dance of the Dragons, but it's really the subtle nods to the book's deeper themes and the character motivations that truly sets the series apart. And in my opinion, they did a really great job portraying the morally ambiguous characters that make up the story, like Daemon and Rhaenyra and Alicent, or really basically any of the major players within the story. Obviously not characters like Blood and Cheese, Oh, I mean, they're pretty bad. If you know, you know. And then there's, of course, the political intrigue, which is a cornerstone of George's work. From the shifting alliances of the great houses to the ever constant miscommunications, every decision carries weight and has consequences that ripple throughout the Seven Kingdoms. And you can really feel that in this show. It's doing a great job at reflecting how these little choices, these little miscommunications have huge consequences consequences because that's ultimately what the Dance of Dragons was. At its core, it's one miscommunication compiled onto another and all mixed with the ultimate hunger for power and greed in the form of the Iron Throne that manifests in each character. And again, in Fire and Blood, these characters are very morally ambiguous. There's no true account of their motivations because it's not even written in, in a POV, which is something that's very different from the Game of Thrones series because each one of those chapters is written as a point of view from all these different characters. Wow. Even though they are unreliable narrators because each has its own perspective, you still understand the character motivations more in that book than in this book. So again, the writers have more leeway here. From the very beginning, the costumes, the sets, and the performances from the actors all capture the essence of Westeros while allowing room for creative interpretation. And honestly, I feel like they're trying to make up for what happened with the last few seasons of Game of Thrones. They obviously know what the reaction was. I mean, there was even a petition to remake the last season. I mean, I definitely signed that petition. <laughs> but anyway, we all knew it wasn't going to get remade, but it was symbolic to let them know that we, the fans, were not happy with that. Are you not ashamed of yourself?
But this has felt really different to me and I have thoroughly enjoyed House of the Dragon so far and watching the two trailers that came out got me really excited to get into the world again. I mean, can we just take a moment to appreciate the brilliance of releasing two trailers? I honestly felt like it was a perfect way to set up the season as a whole. And it is quite accurate to the book as well because that is what the Dance of Dragons is. It's the blacks versus the greens. I personally thought it was perfect marketing for the season and that it really truly made sense within the story and for the buildup of the Dance of Dragons. By framing the conflict between the greens and the blacks, HBO gives us a glimpse into both sides of the brewing war. It's the classic two sides to every story approach. I mean, in trailer one, we focus on the perspective of the core house of Targaryen, the OGs, I would say, Rhaenyra, Daemon group over on Dragonstone. And then meanwhile, in trailer two, we're getting the high tower Targaryen side of things. The costumes looked amazing. The sets looked awesome. Obviously, they're dragons. That's freaking cool. Look at look at and that's another reason why Fire and Blood is such a great part of George's work to adapt because it's so heavy on the dragons. And yes, in Game of Thrones, we got some dragons, but they kind of were more in the later seasons, which were tarnished by the other. <laughs> aspects that went wrong we all know <laughs> but anyway i mean obviously it goes without saying but the epic nature of telling a story filled to the brim with dragons not just dragons though dragon riders Smells out. what <laughs> that's another reason why fire and blood sets the stage for a very successful adaptation ultimately it's just a really epic tale of how the targaryen dynasty basically collapsed within itself and the first season was really almost just like a prologue to the actual meat of the story it was basically just setting up the major players that are involved in the dance of dragons which really is one of the most pivotal events in all of westerosi history and i'm really excited to see how they approach the second season which story they decide to tell basically from the myriad of stories that could be told what do you guys think and which side are you on are you on the greens or are you on the blacks i don't know if it's kind of obvious from um my setup but um i'm kind of like on the black side I don't know, like, I felt like Viserys kind of was like, yeah, I'm Rhaenyra. Like, I don't care if her kids are bastards. She's my heir. And he never wavered on that. I get that Alicent had a little Delulu when she last spoke with him in the show, but, um, yeah, it's Rhaenyra. And we can fight about it in the comments. <laughs> Even though I am on the side of the Blacks, I do think that the cast who play the Greens are really great. The guy who plays Amon is awesome. The guy who plays Aegon is good. I can't wait to see what they get up to. Otto Hightower creeps me out, but I guess that's good. He's a seedy, seedy little man. But yeah, what do you guys think? Which side are you on? All must choose. <laughs> as the trailer says, right? Are you guys excited for season two? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe if you're as hyped for season two as I am. But dang, all this talk about Fire and Blood has really just made me wanna go and reread the book again before the season comes out. So I think I'm gonna go do that now. May your dragons be fierce and your alliances strong. Okay. And I will see you next time. Bye. So when you combine the rich tapestry of fire and blood with the masterful storytelling of House of the Dragon, you get a match made in Westerosi heaven. Stop it. Get some help.